what, where, how and when. Finding out what happened. Yesterday, you could listen to the radio, watch television, read a newspaper. Last year, ask somebody who remembers. But what about long, long ago? Let us see how it can be done. What can we know about the past? There are several things we can find out. What people ate, the kinds of clothes they wore, the houses in which they lived. We can find out about the lives of hunters, herders, farmers, rulers, merchants, priests, craft persons, artists, musicians and scientists. We can also find out about the games children played, the stories they heard, the plays they saw, the songs they sang. Where did people live? Find the river Narmada on map 1 which is on page 2. People have lived along the banks of the river for several hundred thousand years. Some of the earliest people who lived here were skilled gatherers. That is, people who gathered their food. They knew about the vast wealth of plants in the surrounding forests and collected roots, fruits and other forest produce for their food. They also hunted animals. Now find the Suleiman and Girdar hills to the northwest. Some of the areas where women and men first began to grow crops such as wheat and barley about 8000 years ago are located here. People also began rearing animals like sheep, goat and cattle and lived in villages. Locate the Garo Hills to the northeast and the Vindhyas in central India. There were some of the other areas where agriculture developed. The places where rice was first grown are to the north of the Vindhyas. Trace the river Indus and its tributaries. Tributaries were smaller rivers that flow into a larger river. About 4,700 years ago, some of the earliest cities flourished on the banks of, the re of these rivers. Later, about 2,500 years ago, cities developed on the banks of the Ganga and its tributaries and along the sea coasts. Locate the Ganga and its tributaries called the Sun. In ancient times, the area along these rivers to the south of the Ganga was known as Magadha, now lying in the state of Bihar. Its rulers were very powerful and set up a large kingdom. Kingdoms were set up in other parts of the country as well throughout. People travel from one part of the subcontinent to another. The hills and high mountains including the Himalayas, deserts, rivers and seas made journeys dangerous at times, but never impossible. So men and women moved in search of livelihood as also to escape from natural disasters like floods or droughts. Sometimes men marched in armies conquering others' lands. Besides, merchants travelled with caravans or ships carrying valuable goods from place to place and religious teachers walked from village to village, town to town, stopping to offer instructions and advice on the way. Finally, some people perhaps travel driven by a spirit of adventure, wanting to discover new and exciting places. All this led to the sharing of ideas between people. Why do people travel nowadays? Look at map 1 once more, hills, mountains and seas from the natural frontiers of the subcontinent 
while it was difficult to cross these frontiers those who wanted could and did scale the mountains and cross the seas people from across the frontiers also came into the subcontinent and settled here these movements of people enriched our cultural traditions people have shared new ways of carving stones composing music and even cooking food over several hundred years under our views names of land two of the words we often use for our country are india and bharat the word india comes from the indus called sindhu in sanskrit find iran and greece in your atlas the iranians and the greeks who came through the northwest about 2500 years ago and were familiar with the indus called it the hindus or indos and the land to the east of the river was called india the name bharata was used for a group of people who lived in the northwest and who are mentioned in the rigveda the earliest composition in sanskrit dated to about 3500 years ago later it was used for the country finding out about the past there are several ways of finding out about the past one is to search for and read books that were written long ago these are called manuscripts because they were written by hand this comes from the latin word manu meaning hand these were usually written on palm leaf or on the specially prepared bark of a tree known as the birch which grows in the himalayas over the years many manuscripts were eaten away by insects some were destroyed but many have survived often preserved in temples and monasteries these books dealt with all kinds of subjects religious beliefs and practices the lives of kings medicine and science besides there were epics poems plays many of these were written in sanskrit others were in prakrit languages used by ordinary people and tamil we can also study inscriptions these are writings on relatively hard surfaces such as stone or metal sometimes kings got their orders inscribed so that people could see read and obey them there are other kinds of inscriptions as well where men and women including kings and queens recorded what they did for example kings often kept records of victories in battle can you think of the advantage of writing on a hard surface and what could have been the difficulties there were many other things that were made and used in the past those who study these objects are called archaeologists they study the remains of buildings made of stone and brick paintings and sculpture they also explore and excavate dig under the surface of the earth to find tools weapons pots pans ornaments and coins some of these objects may be made of stone others of bone baked clay or metal objects that are made of hard imperishable substances usually survive for a long time archaeologists also look for bones of animals birds and fish to find out what people ate in the past plant remains survive for more rarely 
if seeds of grain or pieces of wood have been burnt they survive in a charred form do you think cloth is found frequently by archaeologists historians that is scholars who study the past often use the word source to refer to the information found from manuscripts inscriptions and archaeology once sources are found learning about the past becomes an adventure as we reconstruct it bit by bit so historians and archaeologists are like detectives who use all the sources like clues to find out about a past so one past or many did you notice the title of this book a pasts we have used the word past in plural to draw attention to the fact that the past was different for different groups of people for example the lives of herders or farmers were different from those of kings and queens the lives of merchants were different from those of crafts persons and so on also as is true even today people follow different practices and customs in different parts of the country for example today most people living in the andaman island get their own food by fishing hunting and collecting forest produce by contrast most people living in cities depend on others for supplies of food differences such as these existed in the past as well besides there is another kind of difference we know a great deal about kings and the battles they fought because they kept records of their victories generally ordinary people such as hunters fishing for gatherers farmers or herders did not keep records of what they did while archaeology helps us to find out about their lives there is much that remains unknown what do dates mean if somebody asks you the date you will probably mention the day month and year 2000 and something these years are counted from the date generally assigned to the birth of jesus christ the founder of christianity so 2000 means 2000 years after the birth of christ all dates before the birth of christ were are counted backwards and usually have the letters bc before christ added on in this book we will refer to dates going back from the present using 2000 as a starting point let us with dates bc we have seen stands for before christ you will sometimes find ad before dates this stands for two latin words anno domini meaning in the year of the lord that is christ so 2012 can also be written as ad 2012 sometimes ce is used instead of ad and bce instead of bc the letter ce stand for common era and bce for before common era we use these terms because the christian era is now used in most countries of the world in india we began using this form of dating from about 200 years ago and sometimes these letters bp meaning before present are used chapter 2 from hunting gathering to growing food tushar's train journey tushar was going from delhi to chennai for his cousin's wedding they were traveling by train and he had managed to squeeze into the window seat his nose glued to the glass pane 
as he watched trees and houses fly past his uncle tapped his shoulder and said do you know that trains were first used about 150 years ago and that people began using buses a few decades later tushar wondered when people couldn't travel quickly from one place to another did they spend their entire lives wherever they were born not quite the earliest people why were they on the move we know about the people who lived in the subcontinent as early as 2 million years ago today we describe them as hunter gatherers the name comes from the way in which they got their food generally they hunted wild animals caught fish and birds gathered fruits roots nuts seeds leaves stalks and eggs hunter gatherers move from place to place there are many reasons for this first if they had stayed at one place for a long time they would have eaten up all the available plant and animal resources therefore they would have had to go elsewhere in search of food second animals move from place to place either in search of smaller prey or in the case of deer and wild cattle in search of grass and leaves that is why those who hunted them had to follow their movements third plants and trees bear fruit in different seasons so people may have moved from season to season in search of different kinds of plants fourth people plants and animals need water to survive water is found in lakes streams and rivers while many rivers and lakes are perennial with water throughout the year others are seasonal people living on their banks would have had to go in search of water during the dry seasons winter and summer how do we know about these people archaeologists have found some of the things hunter gatherers made and used it is likely that people made used tools of stone wood and bone of which stone tools have survived best some of these stone tools were used to cut meat and bone scrape bark from trees and hide animal skins chop fruit and root some may have been attached to handles of bones or wood to make spears and arrows for hunting other tools were used to chop wood which was used as firewood wood was also used to make huts and tools choosing a place to live in look at map 2 below all the places marked with red triangles are sites from which archaeologists have found evidence of hunter gatherers hunter gatherers lived in many more places only some are shown on the map many sites were located near resources near sources of water such as rivers and lakes As stone tools were important, people tried to find places where good quality stone was easily available. Rock paintings and what they tell us. Many of the caves in which these early people lived have paintings on the walls. Some of the best examples are from Madhya Pradesh and Southern Uttar Pradesh. These paintings show wild animals drawn with great accuracy and skill. Bhimbitka In present day Madhya Pradesh, this, cave, this is an old site with caves and rock shelters. People chose these natural caves because they provided shelter from the rain, heat and wind. These rock shelters are close to the Narmada Valley. Can you think of why people chose to live here? Sites are places where the remains of things, tools, pots, buildings, etc. were found. These were made, used and left behind by people. This may be found on the surface of the earth 
buried under the earth or sometimes even under water you will learn more about different sites in later chapters finding out about fire find the kurnool caves on map 2 which is on page 13 traces of ash have been found here this suggests that people were familiar with the use of fire Fire could have been used for many things as a source of light to roast meat and to scare away animals. What do we use fire for today? Names and dates. Archaeologists have given lengthy names for the time that we are studying. They call the earliest period the Paleolithic. This comes from two Greek words. Paleo meaning old and lithos meaning stone. The name points to the importance of finds of stone tools. The Paleolithic period extends from 2 million years ago to about 12,000 years ago. This long stretch of time is divided into the lower, middle and upper Paleolithic. This long span of time covers 99% of human history. Period when we find environmental changes beginning about 12,000 years ago till about 10,000 years ago is called Mesolithic. Middle Stone Stone tools found during this period are generally tiny and are called microliths. Microliths were probably stuck onto hands or bones or wood to make tools such as saws and sickles. At the same time, older varieties of tools continue to be in use. The next stage from about 10,000 years ago is known as the Neolithic. What do you think the term Neolithic means? We have also mentioned the names of some places. You will find the names of many more places in later chapters. Very often we use present day names of the places where people lived in the past because we do not know what they called them. A changing environment. Around 12,000 years ago, there were major changes in the climate of the world. With a shift to relatively warm, warm conditions in many areas, this led to the development of grasslands. This in turn led to an increase in the number of deer, antelope, goat, sheep and cattle, that is animals that survived on grass. Those who hunted these animals now followed them, learning about their food habits and their breeding seasons. It is likely that this helped people to start thinking about herding and rearing these animals themselves. Fishing also became important. The beginning of farming and herding. This was also a time when several grain-bearing grasses including wheat, barley and rice grew. Naturally, in different parts of the subcontinent, men, women and children probably collected these grains as food and learned where they grew and when they ripened. This may have led them to think about growing plants on their own. In this way, people became farmers. People could also attract and then tame animals by leaving for them near their shelters. The first animal to be tamed was the wild ancestor of the dog. Later, people encouraged animals that were relatively gentle to come near the camps where they lived. These animals such as sheep, goat, cattle and also the pig lived in herds and most of them ate grass. Often people protected these animals from attacks by other wild animals. This is how they become herders. Can you think of any reasons why the dog was perhaps the first animal to be tamed? Domestication is the name given to the process in which people grow plants and look after animals. Very often plants and animals that are tended by people become different from wild plants and animals. This is because people select plants and animals for domestication. For example, they select those plants and animals that are not prone to disease. They also select plants that eat 
yield large size grain and have strong stalks capable of bearing the weight of the ripe grain seeds from selected plants are preserved and sown to ensure that new plant seed and seeds will have the same qualities amongst animals those that are relatively gentle are selected for breeding as a result gradually domesticated animals and plants become different from wild animals and plants for example the teeth and horns of wild animals are usually much larger than those of domesticated animals look at these two set of teeth which do you think belongs to a wild pig and which to a domesticated one domestication was a gradual process that took place in many parts of the world it began about 12000 years ago virtually all the plant and animal produce that we use as food today is a result of domestication some of the earliest plants to be domesticated were wheat and barley the earliest domesticated animals include sheep and goat a new way of life if you plant a seed you will notice that it takes some time to grow this may be for several days weeks months and in some cases years when people began growing plants it meant that they had to stay in the same place for a long time looking for other uh, looking after the plants watering weeding driving away animals and birds till the grain ripened and then the grain had to be used carefully as grain had to be stored for both food and seed people had to think of ways of storing it in many areas they began making large clay pots or wove baskets or dug pits into the ground do you think hunter gatherers would have made and used pots give reasons for your answer storing animals animals multiply naturally besides if they are looked after carefully they provide milk which is an important source of food and meat whenever required in other words animals that are reared can be used as a store of food apart from food what are the other things that could have been obtained from animals what are animals used for today finding out about the first farmers and herders turn to map 2 page 13 you will notice a number of blue squares each marks a site from where archaeologists have found evidence of early farmers and herders these are found all over the subcontinent some of the most important ones are in the northwest in present day kashmir and in east and south india to find out whether these sites were settlements of farmers and herders scientists study evidence of plants and animal bones one of the most exciting finds includes remains of burnt grain these may have been burnt accidentally or on purpose scientists can identify these grains and so we know that a number of crops were grown in different parts of the subcontinent they can also identify the bones of different animals towards a settled life archaeologists have found traces of huts or houses at some sites for instance in burzaum in present day kashmir people built pit houses which were dug into the ground with steps leading into them this may have provided shelter in cold weather archaeologists have also found cooking huts both inside and outside the huts which suggests that depending on the weather people could cook food either indoors or outdoors stone tools have been found from many sites as well many of these are different from earlier paleolithic tools and that is why they are called neolithic these include tools that were polished to give a fine cutting edge and mortars and pestles used for grinding grain and other plant produce mortars and pestles are used for grinding grain even today several thousand years later at the same time tools of the paleolithic types continue to be made and used and remember some tools were also made of bone 
Many kinds of earthen pots have also been found. These were sometimes decorated and were used for storing things. People began using pots for cooking food, especially grains like rice, wheat and lentils. That now became an important part of the diet. Besides, they began weaving cloth using different kinds of materials. For example, cotton that could now be grown. Did things change everywhere and all at once? Not quite. In many areas, men and women still continued to hunt and gather food. And elsewhere, people adopted farming and herding slowly over several thousand years. Besides, in some cases, people tried to combine these activities to different things during different seasons. A closer look. Living and dying in Mehergarh. Find Mehergarh in on map 2 page 13. The site is located on a fertile plain near the Bolan Pass, which is one of the most important routes into Iran. Mehergarh was probably one of the places where people learned to grow barley and wheat and rear sheep and goats for the first time in this area. It is one of the earliest villages that we know about. At this site, many animals' bones were found. Bones of wild animals such as the deer and pig and also bones of sheep and goat were found. Other finds at Mehergarh include remains of square or rectangular houses, each of house and four or more compartments, some of which may have been used for storage. When people die, their relatives and friends generally pay respect to them. People look after them perhaps in the belief that there is some form of life after the death. Burial is one such arrangement. Several burial sites have been found at Mehergarh. In one instance, the dead person were buried with goats, which were probably meant to serve as food in the next world. Chapter 3 In the Earliest Cities Saving an old building, Jaspal and Harpreet were playing cricket in the lane outside their home when they noticed the people who were admiring the dilapidated old building that the children called the haunted house. Look at the architecture, said one of the men. Have you seen the fine wood carving? asked one of the women. We must write to the minister so that she makes arrangements to repair and preserve this beautiful house. Why, they wondered, would anybody be interested in the old run-down house? The Story of Harappa Very often, old buildings have a story to tell. Nearly 150 years ago, when railway lines were being laid down for the first time in the Punjab, engineers stumbled upon the site of Harappa in present-day Pakistan. To them, it seemed like a mound that was a rich source of ready-made high-quality bricks. So they carried off thousands of bricks from the walls of the old buildings of the city to build railway lines. Many buildings were completely destroyed. Then about 80 years ago, archaeologists found the site and realized that this was one of the oldest cities in the subcontinent, as this was the first city to be discovered. All other sites from where similar buildings and other things were found were described as Harappan. These cities developed about 4,700 years ago. Very often, old buildings are pulled down to make way for new construction. Do you think it is important to preserve old buildings? What was special about these cities? Many of these cities were divided into two or more parts. Usually, the part to the west was smaller but higher. Archaeologists describe this as the citadel. Generally, the part to the east was larger but lower. This is called the lower town. Very often, walls of baked bricks were built around each part. The bricks were so well baked that they have lasted for thousands year of years. The bricks were laid in an interlocking pattern and that made the walls strong. In some cities, special buildings were constructed on the citadel. 
For example, in Mohenjo-daro, a very special tank, which archaeologists call the Great Bath, was built in this area. This was lined with bricks, coated with plaster, and made watertight with a layer of natural tar. There were steps leading down to it from two sides, while there were rooms on all sides. Water was probably brought in from a well and drained out after use. Perhaps important people took a dip on this tank on special occasions. Other cities such as Kalibangan and Lothal had fire altars where sacrifices may have been performed and some cities like Mohenjo-daro, Harappa and Lothal have elaborate storehouses. Houses, drains and streets. Generally, houses were either one or two stories high with rooms built around a courtyard. Most houses had a separate bathing area and some had wells to supply water. Many of these cities had covered drains. Notice how carefully they were laid out in straight lines. Although you cannot see it, each drain had a gentle slope so that water could flow through it. Very often drains in houses were connected to those on the streets and smaller drains led into bigger ones. As the drains were covered, inspection holes were provided at intervals to clean them. All three houses, drains and streets were probably planned and built at the same time. List at least two differences between the houses described here and those that you studied about in chapter 2. Life in the city A Harappan city was a very busy place. There were people who planned the construction of special buildings in the city. These were probably the rulers. It is likely that the rulers sent people to distant lands to get metal, precious stones and other things that they wanted. They may have kept the most valuable objects such as ornaments of gold and silver or beautiful beads for themselves. And there were scribes, people who knew how to write, who helped prepare the seals and perhaps wrote on other materials that have not survived. Besides, the, there were men and women, craft persons making all kinds of things, either in their own homes or in special workshops. People were traveling to distant lands or returning with raw materials and perhaps stories. Many terracotta toys have been found and children must have played with these. Make a list of the people who lived in the city. Were any of these listed as living in villages such as Mehrgarh? New crafts in the city. Let us look at some of the objects that were made uh, and found in Harappan cities. Most of the things that have been found by archaeologists are made of stone, shell and metal, including copper, bronze, gold and silver. Copper and bronze were used to make tools, weapons, ornaments and vessels. Gold and silver were used to make ornaments and vessels. Perhaps the most striking finds are those of beads made with blades. The Harappans also made seals out of stones. These are generally rectangular. See illustration on page 27 and usually have an animal card on them. The Harappans also made pots with beautiful black designs such as the one shown on page 6. Was metal used in the villages you learned about in chapter 2? Was stone used to make waves? Cotton was probably grown at Mehrgarh from about 7000 years ago. Actual pieces of cloth were found attached to the lid of silver vase and some copper objects at Mohenjo-daro. Archaeologists have fo also found spindle walls made of terracotta and fairness. These were used to spin thread. Many of the things that were produced were probably the work of specialists. A specialist is a person who is trained to do only one kind of work, for example, cutting stone or polishing beads or carving seals. Look at the illustration, page 28, and see how well the face is carved and how carefully the beard is shown. This must have been the work of an expert craftsperson. Not everybody could have been a specialist. 
we did not know whether only men were specialists or only women were specialists. Perhaps some women and men may have been specialists. In search of raw material, raw materials are substances that are either found naturally, such as wood or ores of metals, or produced by farmers or herders. These are then processed to produce finished goods. For example, cotton produced by farmers is a raw material that may be processed to make cloth, while some of the raw materials that the Harappans used were available locally. Many items such as copper, tin, gold, silver and precious stones had to be brought from distant places. The Harappans probably got copper from present-day Rajasthan and even from Oman in West Asia. Tin which was mixed up with copper to produce wool may have been brought from present-day Pakistan. Afghanistan and Iran. Gold could have come all the way from present-day Karnataka and precious stones from present-day Gujarat, Iran and Afghanistan. Food for people in the cities. While many people lived in the cities, others living in the countryside grew crops and reared animals. These farmers and herders supplied food to craftspersons, scribes and rulers in the cities. We know from remains of plants that the Harappans grew wheat, barley, pulses, peas, rice, linseed and mustard. A new tool, the plow, was used to dig the earth for turning the soil and planting seeds. While real plows, which were probably made of wood, have not survived, toy models have been found as this region does not receive heavy rainfall. Some form of irrigation may have been used. This means that water was stored and supplied to the fields when the plants were growing. The Harappas reared cattle, sheep, goat and buffalo. Water and pastures were available around settlements. However, in the dry summer months, large herders of animals were probably taken to greater distances in search of grass and water. They also collected fruits like bear, caught fish and hunted wild animals like the antelope. A closer look, Harappan towns in Gujarat, the city of Dolavira, was located on Khadir Beth, also spelled as Beth, in the run of Kutch, where uh, there was a fresh water and fertile soil. Unlike some of the other Harappan cities, which were divided into two parts, Dolavira was divided into three parts and each part was surrounded with massive stone walls with entrances through gateways there was also a large open area in the settlement where public ceremonies could be held other finds include large letters of the harappan script that were carved out of white stone and perhaps in late input this is a unique find as generally harappan writings has been found on small objects as seals the city of Lothal stood beside a tributary of the Sabarmati in Gujarat, a close to the Gulf of Khambat. It was situated near areas where raw materials such as semi-precious stones were easily available. This was an important center for making objects out of stone, shell and metal. There was also a storehouse in the city. Many seals and ceilings, the impressions of seals on clay, were found in the storehouse. A building that was found here was probably a workshop for making beads, pieces of stone, half-made beads, tools for bead making and finished beads have all been found here. The mystery of the end. Around 3900 years ago, we find the beginning of a major change. People stopped living in many of the cities. Writing seals and weights were no longer used. Raw materials brought from long distances became rare. In Mohanjadaro, we find that garbage piled up on the streets, the drainage system broke down, and new less impressive houses were built, even over the streets. Why did all this happen? We are not sure. Some scholars suggest that the rivers dried up. Others suggest that there was deforestation. This could have happened because fuel was required for baking bricks and for smelting copper ores. Besides, grazing by large herds of cattle, sheep and goat may have destroyed the green cover. 
In some areas there were floods, but none of these reasons can explain the end of all the cities. Flooding or a river drying up would have held, had an effect in only some areas. It appears as if the rulers lost control. In any case, the effects of the change are quite clear. Sites in Sin and West Punjab, present-day Pakistan, were abandoned. While many people moved into newer, smaller settlements to the east and south, new cities emerged about 1400 years later. You will read about them in chapter 5 and 8. Chapter 4 What Books and Burials Tells Us Mary in the Library As the bell rang, the teacher asked the students to follow him because they were going to the library for the first time. When Mary stepped inside, she found that the library was much larger than their classroom and there were so many shelves, all full of books. In one corner was a cupboard filled with large old volumes. Seeing her trying to open the cupboard, the teacher said that cupboard was very special books on different religions. Did you know that we have a set of the Vedas? What are the Vedas? Mary wondered. <coughs> Let us find out. <coughs> one of the oldest books in the world. You may have heard about the Vedas. There are four of them. Rig Veda, Sam Veda, Yajur Veda and Athar Veda. The oldest Veda is the Rig Veda. Composed about 3500 years ago. The Rig Veda includes more than a thousand hymns called Sukta or well said. These hymns are in praise of various gods and goddesses. Three gods are especially important. Agni, the god of fire, Indra, a warrior god, and Soma, a plant from which a special drink was prepared. These hymns were composed by sages, rishis, priests, taught students to recite and memorize each syllable, word, and sentence, bit by bit. With great care, most of the hymns were composed, taught, and learned by men. A few were composed by women. The Rig Veda is in Old or Vedic Sanskrit, which is different from the Sanskrit you learn in school these days. Sanskrit and other languages. Sanskrit is a part of a family of languages known as Indo-European. Some Indian languages such as Assami, Gujarati, Hindi, Kashmiri, and Sindhi. Asian languages such as Persian and many European languages such as English, French, German, Greek, Italian and Spanish belong to this family. They are called a family because they originally had words in common. Take the words Matr Sanskrit, Ma Hindi and Mother English. <coughs> Do you notice any similar similarities? Other languages used in the subcontinent belong to different families. For instance, those used in the Northeast belong to the Tibeto Burman family. Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, and Malayalam be belong to the Dravidian family. And the languages spoken in Jharkhand and parts of Central India belong to the Austro Asiatic family. List the languages you have heard about and try and identify the families to which they belong. The books we use are written and printed. The Rig Veda was recited and heard rather than read. It was written down several centuries after it was first composed and printed less than 200 years ago. How historians study the Rig Veda? Historians like archaeologists find out about the past, but in addition to material remains, they examine written sources as well. Let us see how they study the Rig Veda. Some of the hymns in the Rig Veda are in the form of dialogues. This is part of one such hymn, a dialogue between a sage named Vishwamitra and two rivers, Bees and Sutlej, that were worshipped as goddess. Find the rivers on map 1, page 2, then read on <coughs> Cattle, Horses and Chariots. There are many prayers in the Rig Veda for cattle, children, especially sons, 
and horses. Horses were yoked to chariots that were used in battles which were fought to capture cattle. Battles were also fought for land which was important for pasture and for growing hardy crops that ripened quickly such as barley. <coughs> Some battles were fought for water and to capture people. Some of the wealth that was obtained was kept by the leaders. Some was given to the priests and the rest was distributed among the people. Some wealth was used for performance of yagnas or sacrifices in which offerings were made into the fire. These were meant of gods and goddess. Offerings could include ghee, grain and in some cases animals. Most men took part in these wars. There was no regular army, but there were assemblies where people met and discussed matters of war and peace. They also chose leaders who were often brave and skillful warriors. Words to describe people There are several ways of describing people in terms of the work they do, the language they speak, the place they belong to, their family, their communities and cultural practices. Let us see some of the words used to describe people found in the Rig Veda. There are two groups who are described in terms of their work. The priests, sometimes called Brahmins, who perform various rituals and the Rajas. These Rajas were not like the ones you will be learning about later. They did not have capital cities, palaces or armies nor did they collect taxes. Generally, sons did not automatically succeed fathers as Rajas. Read the previous section once more and see whether you can find out what the Rajas did. Two words were used to describe the people or the community as a whole. One was the word Jana, which we still use in Hindi and other languages. The other was Vish. The word Vaisha comes from Vish. You will learn more about this chapter 5. Several Vish or Jana are mentioned by name. So we find references to the Purujana or Vish, the Bharata Jana or Vish, the Yadu Jana or Vish and so on. Do any of these names sound familiar? Sometimes the people who compose the hymns describe themselves as Aryas and call their opponents Dasas or Dasis. These were people who did not perform sacrifices and probably spoke different languages. Later the term Dasa and the feminine Dasi came to mean slave. Slaves were women and men who were often captured in war. They were treated as the property of their owners, who could make them do whatever work they wanted. While the Rig Veda was being composed in the northwest of the subcontinent, there were other developments elsewhere. Let us look at some of these. Silent Sentinels, the story of the Megaliths. Look at the illustration on the next page. These stone holders are known as Megaliths, literally big stones. These were carefully arranged by people and were used to mark burial sites. The practice of erecting megaliths began about 3000 years ago and was prevalent throughout the Deccan, South India in the Northeast and Kashmir. Some important megalith sites are shown on map to page 13. While some megaliths can be seen on the surface, other megalith burials are often underground. Sometimes archaeologists find a circle of stone boulders or a single large stone standing on the ground. These are the only indications that there are burials beneath. There were several things that people did to make megaliths. We have made a list here. Try and arrange them in the correct order. Digging pits in the earth, transporting stones, breaking boulders, placing stones in positions, finding suitable stones, shaping stones, burial the dead. All these burials have some common features. Generally, the dead were buried with distinctive pots which are called black and red ware. Also found are tools and weapons of iron and sometimes skeletons of horses, horse equipment and ornaments of stone and coal. Was iron used in the Harappan cities? Finding out about social differences, archaeologists think that objects found with a skeleton probably belong to the dead person. Sometimes more objects are found in one grave than in another. Find Brahmagiri on map to page 13. 
Here one skeleton was buried with 33 gold beads, 2 stone beads, 4 copper bangles and 1 conch shell. Other skeletons have only a few pots. These finds suggest that there was some difference in status among the people who were buried. Some were rich, others were poor, some chiefs and others followers. Were some burial spots meant for certain families? Sometimes megaliths contain more than one skeleton. These indicate that people perhaps belonging to the same family were buried in the same place though not at the same time. The bodies of those who died later were brought into the grave through the potholes. Stone circles or boulders placed on the surface probably served as signposts to find the burial site so that the people could return to the same place whenever they wanted to. A special burial at Inamga. Find Inamga on map 2. It is a site on the river Gurd, a tributary of the Bhima. It was occupied between 3600 and 2700 years ago. Here, adults were generally buried in the ground laid out straight with the head towards the north. Sometimes, burials were within the houses, vessels that probably contained food and water were placed with the dead. One man was found buried in a large four leg Licked clay jar in the courtyard of five roomed house, one of the largest houses at the site. In the uh, center of the settlement, this house also had a granary. The body was placed in a cross legged position. Do you think this was the body of a chief? Give reasons for your answers. Occupations at Inamka Archaeologists have found seeds of wheat, barley, rice, pulses, millets, peas, and sesame. Bones of a number of animals, many bearing cut marks that show they may have been used as food, have also been found. These include cattle, buffalo, goat, sheep, dog, horse, ass, pig, summer, spotted deer, black buck, antelope, hare, and mongoose. Besides bird, crocodile, turtle, crab, and fish. There is evidence that fruits such as veer, amla, jamun, dates, and a variety of berries were collected. Use this evidence to list uh, the possible occupations of the people at Inamga. Chapter 5 Kingdoms, Kings, and an Early Republic. Election Day. Shankaran woke up to see his grandparents all ready to go and vote. They wanted to be the first to reach the polling booth. Why? Shankaran wanted to know. Were they so excited? Somewhat impatiently, his grandfather explained, We can choose our own rulers today. How some men became rulers? Choosing leaders or rulers by voting is something that has become common during the last 50 years or so. How did men become rulers in the past. Some of the Rajas we read about in chapter 4 were probably chosen by the Jana, the people. But around 3000 years ago, we find some changes taking places in the ways of, in which Rajas were chosen. Some men now became recognized by as Rajas by performing very big sacrifices. The Ashwamedha or horse sacrifice was one such ritual. A horse was let loose to wander freely and it was guarded by the Raja's men. If the horse wandered into the kingdoms of other Rajas and they stopped it, they had to fight. If they allowed the horse to pass, it meant that they accepted that the Raja who wanted to perform the sacrifice was stronger than them. These Rajas were then invited to the sacrifice, which was performed by specially trained priests who were rewarded with gifts. The Raja who organized the sacrifice was recognized as being very powerful and all those who came brought gifts for him. The Raja was a central figure in these rituals. He often had a special seat, a throne or a tiger skin. His charioteer was who was his companion in the battlefield and witnessed his exploits, chanted tales of his glory. His relatives, especially his wives and sons, had to perform a variety of minor rituals. The other Rajas were simply spectators who had to sit and watch the performance of the sacrifice. 
priests performed the rituals including the sprinkling of sacred water on the king. The ordinary people, the Vish or Vaishya, also brought gifts. However, some people such as those who were regarded as Shudras by the priests were excluded from many rituals. Make a list of all those who would be present at the sacrifice. Which are the categories that are described in terms of the occupation? Varnas. We have many books that were composed in North India, especially in the areas drained by the Ganga and the Yamuna. During this period, these books are called uh, later uh, Vedic because they were composed after the Rig Veda about which you learned in chapter 4. These include in the Samveda, Yajurveda and Atharva Veda as well as other books. There were composed by priests and described how rituals were to be performed. They also contained rules about the society. There were several different groups in society at this time. Priests and warriors, farmers, herders, traders, craftspersons, laborers, fishing, fog and forest people. Some priests and warriors were rich as were some farmers and traders. Others including many herders, craftspersons, laborers, fishing folk and hunters and gatherers were poor. The priests divided people into four groups called Varnas. According to them, each Varna had a different set of functions. The first Varna was that of the Brahmin. Brahmins were expected to study and teach the Vedas, perform sacrifices and receive gifts. In the second place were the rulers, also known as Kshatriyas. They were expected to fight battles and protect the people. Third were the Vish or the Vaishyas. They were expected to be farmers, herders and traders. Both the Kshatriyas and the Vaishyas could perform sacrifices. Last were the Shudras who had to serve the other three groups and could not perform any rituals. Often women were also grouped with the Shudras. Both women and Shudras were not allowed to study the Vedas. The priest also said that these groups were decided on the basis of birth. For example, if one's father and mother were Brahmins, one would automatically become a Brahmin and so on. Later, they classified some people as untouchable. These included some craftspersons, hunters and gatherers, as well as people who helped perform burials and cremations. The priest said that contact with these groups was polluting. Many people did not accept the system of Varna laid down by the Brahmins. Some kings thought they were superior to the priests. Others felt that birth could not be a basis for deciding that Varna people belonged to. Besides, some people felt that there should be no differences amongst people based on occupation. Others felt that everybody should be able to perform rituals and others condemned the practice of untouchability. Also, there were many areas in the subcontinent such as the Northeast where social and economic differences were not very sharp and where the influence of the priests was limited. Why did people oppose the system of Varnas? Janapadas The Rajas who performed these big sacrifices were now recognized as being Rajas of Janapadas rather than Janas. The word Janapada literally means the land where the Jana set its foot and settled down. Some important Janapadas are shown on map for page 49. Archaeologists have excavated a number of settlements in these Janapadas, such as Purana Kela in Delhi, Hastinapur near Meerut, and Atranti Khera near Ita. The last two are in Uttar Pradesh. They found that people lived in huts and kept cattle as well as other animals. They also grew a variety of crops rice, wheat, barley, pulses, sugarcane, sesame, and mustard. Is there a crop in the list that was not mentioned in chapter 3? They made earthen pots. Some of these were grey in colour, others were red. One special type of pottery found at these sites is known as painted grey ware. As is obvious from the name, these grey pots had painted designs usually simple lines and geometric patterns. 
Mahajanapadas About 2500 years ago, some Janapadas became more important than others and were known as Mahajanapadas. Some of these are shown on map 4. Most Mahajanapadas and the capital city, many of these were fortified. This means that huge walls of wood, brick or stone were built around them. Forts were probably built because people were afraid of attacks from other kings and needed protection. It is also likely that some rulers wanted to show how rich and powerful they were by building really large, tall and impressive walls around their cities. Also in this way, the land and the people living inside the fortified area could be controlled more easily by the king. Building such huge walls required a great deal of plan. Thousands if not lakhs of bricks or stones had to be prepared. This in turn meant enormous labor provided possibly by thousands of men, women and children and resources had to be found for all this. The new Rajas now began maintaining armies. Soldiers were paid regular salaries and maintained by the king throughout the year. Some payments were probably made using punch marked coins. See the illustration on page 48. You will read more about these coins in chapter 8. List two ways in which the Rajas of the Mahajanpadas were different from those mentioned in the Rig Veda. Taxes As the rulers of the Mahajanpadas were uh, building huge forts, maintaining big armies, they needed more resources and they needed officials to collect these. So instead of depending on occasional gifts brought by people as in the case of the Raja of the Janapadas, they started collecting regular taxes. Taxes on crops were the most important. This was because most people were farmers. Usually the tax was fixed at one-sixth of what was produced. This was known as bhaga or a share. There were taxes on craft persons as well. These could have been in the form of labor. For example, a weaver or a smith may have had to work for a day every month for the king. Herders were also expected to pay taxes in the form of animals and animal produce. There were also taxes on goods that were brought as sold through trade. And hunters and gatherers also had to provide forest produce to the Raja. What do you think would have been provided by hunters and gatherers? Changes in Agriculture There were two major changes in agriculture around this time. One was the growing use of iron plowshares. This meant that heavy clay soil could be turned over better than with a wooden plowshare so that more grain could be produced. Second, people began transplanting paddy. This meant that instead of scattering seeds on the ground from which plants would sprout, saplings were grown and then planted in the fields. This led to increased production. As many more plants survived, however, it was back-breaking work. Generally, slave men and women, dasas and dasis and landless agriculturals Laborers, Kamakaras had to do this work. Can you think why kings would encourage these changes? A closer look. Magza. Find Magza on map 4, page 49. Magza became the most important Mahajanapada in about 200 years. Many rivers such as Ganga and Sun flowed through Magza. This was important for transport, water supplies, making the land fertile, parts of Magda were forested. Elephants which lived in the forest could be captured and trained for the army. Forest also provided wood for building houses, carts and chariots. Besides, there were iron ore mines in the region that could be tapped to make strong tools and weapons. Magda had two very powerful rulers, Bimbisar and Ajat Astu, who used all people, all possible means to conquer other Janapadas. Mahapadma Nanda was another important ruler. He extended his control up to the northwest part of the subcontinent. Rajagriha, present day Rajgir in Bihar, was the capital of Magadha for several years. 
later the capital was shifted to Patliputra, present day Patna. More than 2300 years ago, a ruler named Alexander, who lived in Macedonia in Europe, wanted to become a world conqueror. Of course, he didn't conquer the world but did conquer parts of Egypt and West Asia and came to the Indian subcontinent, reaching up to the banks of the bees. When he wanted to march further eastwards, his soldiers refused. They were scared as they had heard that the rulers of India had vast armies of foot soldiers, chariots and elephants. In what ways were these armies different from those described in the Rig Veda? A closer look. Vajji. While Magda became a powerful kingdom, Vajji with its capital at Vaishali Bihar was under a different form of government known as Gana or Sangha. In a Gana or a Sangha, there were not one but many rulers. Sometimes even when thousands of men ruled together, each one was known as Raja. These Rajas performed rituals together. They also met in assemblies and decided what had to be done and how, through discussions and debate. For example, if they were attacked by an enemy, they met to discuss what should be done to meet the threat. However, women Dasas and Kamakaras could not participate in these assemblies. Both the Buddha and Mahavira, about whom you will read in Chapter 6, belong to Ganas or Sanghas. Some of the most vivid descriptions of life in the Sanghas can be found in Buddhist books. Rajas of powerful kingdoms tried to conquer the Sanghas. Nevertheless, these lasted for a very long time, till about 1500 years ago, when the last of the Ganas or Sanghas were conquered by the Gupta rulers about whom you will read in Chapter 10. Chapter 6 New Questions and Ideas Anga's School Trip this was the first time Anaga was going on a school trip. They boarded the train from Pune in Maharashtra late at night to go all the way to Varanasi in Uttar Pradesh. Her mother, who came to see her off at the station, told the teacher to tell the children about the Buddha and take them to see Sarnath as well. The story of Bud Buddha, Siddhartha, also known as Gautama. The founder of Buddhism was born about 2500 years ago. This was a time of rapid change in the lives of people. As you saw in Chapter 5, some kings in the Mahajanpadas were growing more powerful. New cities were de developing and life was changing in the villages as well as see Chapter 9. Many thinkers were trying to understand these changes in society. They also wanted to try and find out the true meaning of life. The Buddha belonged to a small Gana known as the Sakya Gana and was a Kshatriya. When he was a young man, he left the comforts of his home in search of knowledge. He wandered for several years meeting and holding discussions with other thinkers. He finally decided to find his own path to realization and meditated for days on end under a people tree at Bodh Gaya in Bihar, where he attained enlightenment. After that, he was known as Buddha or the Wise One. He then went to Sarnath near Varanasi, where he thought for the first time. He spent the rest of his life traveling on foot, going from places to place, teaching people till he passed away at Kushinara. The Buddha thought that life is full of suffering and unhappiness. This is caused because we have cravings and desires which often cannot be fulfilled. Sometimes even if we get what we want, we are not satisfied and what and want even more or want other things. The Buddha described this as thirst or tanha. He thought that this constant craving 
could be removed by following moder moderation in everything. He also taught people to be kind and to respect the lives of others, including animals. We believe that the results of our actions called karma, whether good or bad, affect us both in this life and the next. The Buddha taught in the language of the ordinary people Prakrit so that everybody could understand his message. What was the language used to compose the Vedas? He also encouraged people to think for themselves rather than to simply accept what he said. Let us see how he did this. The story of Kisogat, uh, Kisogatni here is a famous story about the Buddha. Once there was a woman named Kisakotami whose son had died. She was so sad that she roamed through the streets of the city carrying the child with her asking for help to bring him back to life. A kind man took her to the Buddha. The Buddha said, bring me a handful of mustard seeds and I'll bring your child back to life. Kisakotami was overjoyed and started off at once, but the Buddha gently stopped her and added, The seeds must come from the house of a family where nobody has died. Kisakotami went from door to door, but wherever she went, she found out that someone or the other, father, mother, sister, brother, husband, wife, child, uncle, aunt, grandfather, grandmother had died. What was the Buddha trying to teach the sorry mother? Upanishads. Around the time that Buddha was preaching, perhaps a little earlier, other thinkers also tried to find answers to difficult questions. Some of them wanted to know about life after death. Others wanted to know why such sacrifices should be performed. Many of these thinkers felt that there was something permanent in the universe that would last even after death. They described this as the Atma or the individual soul and the Brahmana or the universal soul. They believed that ultimately both the Atma and the Brahman were one. Many of their ideas were recorded in the Upanishads. These were part of the later Vedic text. Upanishad literally means approaching and sitting near and the text contain conversations between teachers and students. Often ideas were presented through simple dialogues. Most Upanishadic thinkers were men, especially Brahmins and Rajas. Occasionally there is mention of women thinkers such as Gargi who was famous for her learning and participated in debates held in royal courts. Poor people rarely took part in these discussions. One famous exception was Satyagama Jawala who was named after his mother, the slave woman Jawali. He had a deep desire to learn about reality, was accepted as a student by a Brahmin teacher named Gautama and became one of the best known thinkers of the time. Many of the ideas of the Upanishads were later developed by the famous thinker Shankaracharya, about whom you will read in class 7. Jainis The last and 24th Tirthankara of the Jainas, Vardhamana Mahavira, also spread his message around this time. That is 2500 years ago. He was a Kshatriya prince of the Lichavis, a group that was part of the Vajji Sangha, about which you read in chapter 5. At the age of 30, he left home and went to live in a forest. For 12 years, he led a hard and lonely life, at the end of which he attained enlightenment. He thought, he thought a simple doctrine. Men and women who wished to know the tr truth must leave their homes. They must follow very strictly the ruler, rules of Ahimsa, which means not hurting or killing living beings. All beings, said Mahavira, long to live. To all things life is there. Ordinary people could understand the teachings of Mahavira and his followers because they used Prakrit. There were several forms of Prakrit used in different parts of the country. 
and named after the regions in which they were used. For example, the Prakrit spoken in Magda was known as Magadi. Followers of Mahavira, who were known as Jainas, had to lead very simple lives, begging for food. They had to be absolutely honest and were especially asked not to steal. Also, they had to observe celibacy and men had to give up everything including their clothes. It was very difficult for most men and women to follow these strict rules. Nevertheless, thousands left their homes to learn and teach this new way of life. Many more remained behind and supported those who became monks and nuns, providing them with food. Jainism was supported mainly by traders. Farmers who had to kill insects to protect their crops found it more difficult to follow the rules. Over hundreds of years, Jainism spread to different parts of North India and to Gujarat, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. The teachings of Mahavira and his followers were transmitted orally for several centuries. They were written down in the form in which they are presently available at a place called Vallabhi in Gujarat about 1500 years ago. See Map 7, page 105. The Sangha, both the Mahavira and the Buddha felt that only those who left their homes could gain true knowledge. They arranged for them to stay together in the Sangha, an association of those who left their homes. The rules made by the Buddhist Sangha were written down in a book called the Vinaya Pitaka. From this we know that there were separate branches for men and women. All men could join the Sangha. However, children had to take the permission of their parents and slaves that of their masters. Those who worked for the king had to take his permission and debtors that of creditors. Women had to take their husband's permission. Men and women who joined the Sangha led simple lives. They meditated for most of the time and went to the cities and villages to beg for food during fixed hours. That is why they were known as bhikshus, the Prakrit word for renouncer beggar. And bhikkhunis, they taught others and helped one another. They also held meetings to settle any quarrels that took place within the Sangha. Those who joined the Sangha included Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Merchants, Labourers, Barbers, courtesans and slaves. Many of them wrote down the teachings of the Buddha. Some of them also composed beautiful poems describing their life in the Sangha. List at least two ways in which the Sangha described in this lesson was different from the one mentioned in chapter 5. Were there any similarities? Monasteries. To begin with, both Jaina and Buddhist monks went from place to place throughout the year, teaching people. The only time they stayed in one place was during the rainy season when it, it was very difficult to travel. Then their supporters built temporary shelters for them in gardens, or they lived in natural caves in hilly areas. As time went on, many supporters of the monks and nuns and they themselves felt the need for more permanent shelters and so monasteries were built. These were known as viharas. The earliest viharas were made of wood and then of brick. Some were even in caves that were dug out in hills, especially in western India. Very often the land on which the vihara was built was donated by a rich merchant or a landowner or the king. The local people came with gifts of food, clothing and medicines for the monks and nuns. In return, they taught the people. Over the centuries, Buddhism spread to many parts of the subcontinent and beyond. You will learn more about this in Chapter 9.
चैप्टर सेवन अशोका द एम्प्रर हु गेव अप वॉर रोशन रुपीस रोशन क्लच द क्रिस्प नोट्स दैट हर ग्रांड फादर हैड गिवन हर ऑन हर बर्थडे वाइल शी बैटली वॉन्टेड टू बाय अ न्यू सी डी शी ऑलवेज वॉन्टेड टू जस्ट सी एंड फील द ब्रांड न्यू नोट्स इट वॉज देन दैट शी नोटिस दैट ऑल ऑफ देम हैड अ स्माइलिंग फेस ऑफ गांधी जी प्रिंटेड ऑन द राइट and a tiny set of lions on the left what were the lions there for she wanted a very big kingdom an empire the lions that we see on our notes and coins have a long history they were carved in stone and placed on top of a massive stone pillar at sarnath about which you read in chapter 6 Ashoka was one of the greatest rulers known to history and on his instructions inscriptions were inscribed on pillars as well as on rock surfaces before we find out what was written in these inscriptions let us see why his kingdom was called an empire the empire that ashoka ruled was founded by his grandfather chandragupta maurya More than 2,300 years ago, Chandragupta was supported by a wise man named Chanakya, or Kautilya. Many of Chanakya's ideas were written down in a book called the Arthashastra Dynasty. When members of the same family become rulers one after another, the family is often called a dynasty. The Mauryas were a dynasty with three important rulers: Chandragupta, his son Bindusara, and Bindusara's son Ashoka. There were several cities in the empire marked with black dots on the map. These included the capital Pataliputra, Takshila, and Ujjain. Takshila was a gateway to the northwest, including Central Asia. while ujjain lay on the route from north to south india merchants officials and crafts person probably lived in these cities in other areas there were villages of farmers and herders in some areas such as central india there were forests where people gathered forest produce and hunted animals for food people in different parts of the empire spoke different languages they probably ate different kinds of food and wore different kinds of clothes as well how are empires different from kingdoms emperors need more resources than kings because empires are larger than kingdoms and need to be protected by big armies so also they need a larger number of officials who collect taxes ruling the empire as the empire was so large different parts were ruled differently the area around pataliputra was under the direct control of the emperor this meant that officials were appointed to collect taxes from farmers herders crafts persons and traders who lived in villages and towns in the area officials also punished those who disobeyed the ruler's orders many of these officials were given salaries messengers went to and fro and spies kept a watch on the officials and of course the emperor sup- supervised them all with the help of members of the royal family and senior ministers there were other areas or provinces each of these was ruled from a provincial capital such as takshila or ujjain although there was some amount of control from pataliputra and royal princes were often sent as governors local customs and rules were probably followed besides there were vast areas between these centers here the mauryas tried to control roads and rivers which were important for transport and to collect whatever resources were available as tax and tribute 
For example, the Arth Shastra tells us that the Northwest was important for blankets and South India for its gold and precious stones. It is possible that these resources were collected as tribute. Tribute, unlike taxes, which were collected on a regular basis, tribute was collected as and when it was possible from people who gave a variety of things more or less willingly. There were also the forested regions. People living in these areas were more or less independent but may have been expected to provide elephants, timber, honey and wax to Mauryan officials. Ashoka a unique ruler. The most famous Mauryan ruler was Ashoka. He was the first ruler who tried to take his message to the people through inscriptions. Most of Ashoka's inscriptions were in Prakrit and were written in the Brahmi script. Ashoka's war in Kalinga. Kalinga is the ancient name of coastal Orissa. See map 5 page 68. Ashoka fought a war to conquer Kalinga. However, he was so horrified when he saw the violence and bloodshed that he decided not to fight any more wars. He is the only king in the history of the world who gave up conquest after winning a war. What was Ashoka's Dhamma? Ashoka's Dhamma did not involve worship of a god or performance of a sacrifice. He felt that just as a father tries to teach his children, he had a duty to instruct his subjects. He was also inspired by the teachings of the Buddha. Chapter 6 There were a number of problems that troubled him. People in the empire followed different religions and this sometimes led to conflict. Animals were sacrificed. Slaves and servants were ill-treated. Besides, there were quarrels in families and among neighbors. Ashoka felt it was his duty to solve these problems. So he appointed official known as Dhamma Mahamata who went from place to place teaching people about Dhamma. Besides, Ashoka got his message is inscribed on rocks and pillars, instructing his officials to read his message to those who could not read it themselves. Ashoka also sent messengers to spread ideas about Dhamma to other lands such as Syria, Egypt, Greece and Sri Lanka. Try and identify these on map 6 pages 76 to 77. He built roads, dug wells and built rest houses. Besides, he arranged for medical treatment for both human beings and animals. Chapter 8 white villages, thriving towns. Prabhakar at the blacksmith's shop. Prabhakar sat watching the smith at the local shop. There was a small bench on which iron tools like axes and sickles were laid out, ready for sale. A bright fire was burning and two men were heating and beating metal rods into shape. It was very hot and noisy and yet it was fascinating to watch what was happening. Iron Tools and Agriculture We often take the use of iron for granted today. Things made of iron and steel are a part of our daily lives. The use of iron began in the subcontinent around 3000 years ago. Some of the largest collections of iron tools and weapons were found in the megalith burials about which you read in chapter 4. Around 2500 years ago, there is evidence for the growing use of iron tool. These included access for clearing forests and the iron plowshare 
as we had seen chapter 5 the plowshare was useful for increasing agricultural production other steps to increase production irrigation the kings and kingdoms you have been reading about could not have existed without the support of flourishing villages while new tools and the system of transplantation chapter 5 increased production irrigation was also used irrigation works that were built during this time included canals wells tanks and artificial lakes if you look at the chart you will find that some of the stages in the construction of irrigation works are mentioned who lived in the villages there were at least three different kinds of people living in most villages in the southern and northern parts of the subcontinent in the Tam tamil region large land owners were known as velalar ordinary bromen were known as uzavar and landless laborers including slaves were known as kadasiar and adiyami in the northern part of the country the village headman was known as the grama bojaka usually men from the same family held the position for generations in other words the post was hereditary the grama bojaka was often the largest land owner generally he had slaves and hired workers to cultivate the land Besides, as he was powerful, the king often used him to collect taxes from the villagers. He also functioned as a judge and sometimes as a policeman. Apart from the Gram Bhujaka, there were other independent farmers known as Grihapatis, most of whom were smaller landowners. And then there were men and women such as the Dasa Karmakara who did not own land and had to earn a living working on the fields owned by others. In most villages there were also some craftspersons such as the blacksmith, potter, carpenter and weaver. The earliest Tamil compositions some of the earliest works in Tamil known as Sangam literature were composed around 2300 years ago. These texts were called Sangam because they were supposed to have been composed and compiled by in assemblies known as Sangams of poets that were held in the city of Madurai. See map 7 page 105. The Tamil terms mentioned above are found in Sangam literature. Finding out about cities, stories, travelers, sculpture and archaeology. You may have heard of the Jatakas. These were stories that were probably composed by ordinary people and then written down and preserved by Buddhist monks. Here is a part of a Jataka story which tells us how a poor man gradually became rich. We can use other kinds of evidence to find out about life in some of these early cities. Sculptures, carved scenes depicting people live in towns and villages as well as in the forest. Many of these sculptures were used to decorate railings, pillars and gateways of buildings that were visited by people. Many of the cities that developed from about 2500 years ago were capitals of the Mahajanapadas that you learned about in chapter 5. As we had seen, some of these cities were surrounded by massive fortification walls. In many cities, archaeologists have found rows of pots or ceramic rings arranged one on top of the other. These are known as ring wells. These seem to have been used as toilets in some cases and as drains and garbage dumps. These ring wells 
are usually found in individual houses. We have hardly any remains of palaces, markets or of homes of ordinary people. Perhaps some are yet to be discovered by archaeologists. Others made of wood, mud brick and thatched may not have survived. Another way of finding out about early cities is from the accounts of sailors and travellers who visited them. One of the most detailed accounts that has been found was by an unknown Greek sailor. He described all the ports he visited. Find Baruch on map 7, page 105 and then read his description of the city. Coins You may have noticed how wealth is measured in terms of coins. In the story on page 82, archaeologists have found several thousand of coins belonging to this period. The earliest coins which were in use for about 500 years were punch marked coins such as the one shown below. Cities with many functions Very often a single town was important for a variety of reasons. Let us look at the example of Mathura. Mathura has been an important settlement for more than 2500 years. It was important because it was located at the crossroads of two major routes of travel and trade from the northwest to the east and from north to south. There were fortifications around the city and several shrines farmers and herders from adjoining areas provided food for people in the city. Mathura was also a center where some extremely fine sculpture was produced. Around 2000 years ago, Mathura became the second capital of the Kushanas, about whom you will be reading in chapter 9. Mathura was also a religious center. There were Buddhist monasteries, Jaina shrines, and it was an important center for the worship of Krishna. Several inscriptions on surfaces such as stone slabs and statues have been found in Mathura. Generally, these are short inscriptions recording gifts made by men and sometimes women to monasteries and shrines. These were made by kings and queens, officers, merchants and crafts, persons who lived in the city. For instance, inscriptions from Mathura mention goldsmiths, blacksmiths, weavers, basket makers, grand garland makers, perfumes. Make a list of the occupation of people who lived in Mathura. List one occupation that was not practiced in Harappan cities. Crafts and crafts persons. We also have archaeological evidence for crafts. These include extremely fine pottery known as the Northern Black Polished Ware. It gets its name from the fact that it is generally found in the northern part of the subcontinent. Remember that the archaeological evidence for many crafts may not have survived. We know from texts that the manufacture of cloth was important. There were famous centers such as Varanasi in the north and Madurai in the south. Both men and women worked in these centers. Many craftspersons and merchants now formed associations known as Shrenis. These Shrenis of craftspersons provided training, procured raw material and distributed the finished product. Then Shrenis or merchants organized the trade. Shrenis also served as banks where rich men and women deposited money. This was invested and part of the interest was returned or used to support religious institutions such as monasteries. A closer look Arika Medu Find Arika Medu in Puducherry on map 7 page 105 and read the box on Rome on page 88. Between 2200 and 1900 years ago, Arikamedu 
was a coastal settlement where ships unloaded goods from distant lands. A massive brick structure, which may have been a warehouse, was found at the site. Other finds include pottery from the Mediterranean regions such as amphorae, tall double-handled jars that contain liquids such as wine or oil, and stamped red glazed pottery known as Aretine Ware, which was named after a city in Italy. This was made by pressing wet clay into a stamped mold. There was yet another kind of pottery which was made locally, though Roman designs were used. Roman lamps, glassware and gems have also been found at the site. Small tanks have been found that were probably dyeing vats used to dye clothes. There is plenty of evidence for the making of beads from semi-precious stones and glass. List the evidence that indicates that there was contact with Rome. Chapter 9 Traders, Kings and Pilgrims Jagini at the market Jagini looked forward to the fair in the village. She loved to see and touch the pots and pans of shiny steel, bright plastic buckets, cloth printed with brilliant floral designs and clockwork toys, all of which came from the city. The men who spread out their wares came in buses and trucks and went back at the end of the day. Why were they always on the move? She wondered. Her mother explained that they were traders. People who bought things were they were made and sold them elsewhere. How to find out about trade and traders? You read about the northern black polished ware in chapter 8. This fine pottery, especially bowls and plates, were found from several archaeological sites throughout the subcontinent. How do you think it reached these places? Traders may have carried them from the places where they were made to sell them at other places. South India was famous for gold, spices, especially pepper and precious stones. Pepper was particularly valued in the Roman Empire, so much so that it was known as black gold. So traders carried many of these golds to Rome in ships across the sea and by land in caravans. There must have been quite a lot of trade as many Roman gold coins have been found in South India. Can you think of how and why these reached? Traders explored several sea routes. Some of these followed the coasts. There were others across the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal, where sailors took advantage of the monsoon winds to cross the seas more quickly. So if they wanted to reach the western coast of the subcontinent from East Africa or Arabia, they chose to sail with the southwest monsoon and sturdy ships had to be built for these long journeys. New kingdoms along the coasts, the southern half of the subcontinent is marked by a long coastline and with hills, plateaus and river valleys. Amongst the river valleys, that of the Kaveri is the most fertile. Chiefs and kings who controlled the river valleys and the coasts became rich and powerful. Sangam poems mention the Muvendar. This is a Tamil word meaning the three chips used for the heads of three ruling families, the Cholas, Cheras and Pandyas. See map 7 page 105. Who became powerful in South India around 2300 years ago? Each of the three chips had two centers of power, one 
inland and one on the coast. Of these six cities, two were very important Puhar or Kaveri Pattinam, the port of the Cholas, and Madurai, the capital of the Pandyas. The chiefs did not collect regular taxes. Instead, they demanded and received gifts from the people. They also went on military expeditions and collected tribute from the neighboring areas. They kept some of the wealth and distributed the rest amongst their supporters, including members of their family, soldiers and poets. Many poets whose compositions are found in the Sangam collection composed poems in praise of chiefs who often rewarded them with precious stones, gold, horses, elephants, chariots and fine cloth. Around 200 years later, a dynasty known as the Satavnas became powerful in Western India. See Map 7, page 105. The most important ruler of the Satavnas was Gautamiputra Sri Satakarni. We know about him from an inscription composed on behalf of his mother, Gautami Balashri. He and other Satavna rulers were known as lords of the Dakshinapatha, literally the route leading to the south, which was also used as a name for the entire southern region. He sent his army to the eastern, western and southern coast. Why do you think he wanted to control the coasts? The story of the Silk Route the rich glossy colors of silk as well as its smooth texture make it a highly valued fabric in most societies. Making silk is a complicated process. Raw silk has to be extracted from the cocoons of silk worms, spun into thread and then woven into cloth. Techniques of making silk were first invented in China around 7000 years ago. While the methods remain a closely guarded secret for thousands of years, some people from China who went to distant lands on foot, horseback and on camels carried silk with them. The paths they followed came to be known as the Silk Road. Sometimes Chinese rulers sent gifts of silk to rulers in Iran and West Asia and from there the knowledge of silk spread further west. About 2000 years ago, wearing silk became the fashion amongst rulers and rich people in Rome. It was very expensive as it had to be brought all the way from China. Along dangerous roads, through mountains and deserts, people living among, uh, along the route often demanded payments for allowing traders to pass through. Look at map 6, page 76 to 77, which shows the Silk Road and its branches. Some kings tried to control large portions of the route. This was because they could benefit from taxes, tributes and gifts that were bought by traders travelling along the route. In return, they often protected the traders who passed through their kingdoms from attacks by robbers. The best known of the rulers who controlled the Silk Road were the Kushanas, who ruled over Central Asia and Northwest India. Around 2000 years ago, their two major centers of power were Peshawar and Mathura. Takshila was also included in their kingdom. During their rule, a branch of the Silk Route extended from Central Asia down to the seaports of, at the mouth of the river Indus, from where silk was shipped westwards to the Roman Empire. The Kushanas were amongst the earliest rulers of the subcontinent to issue gold coins. These were used by traders along the Silk Road. Why do you think it would have been difficult to use carts along the Silk Road? Silk was also sent from China by sea. 
ट्रीज द रूट्स ऑन मैप सेक्स पेज सेवेंटी सिक्स सेवेंटी सेवन वॉट डू यू थिंक वुड है एंड प्रॉब्लम इन ट्रांसपोर्टिंग सिल्क बाय सी द स्प्रेड ऑफ बुद्धिस द मोस्ट फेमस कुशाना रूलर वॉज कनिष्का हु रूल्ड अराउंड नाइनटीन हंड्रेड ईयर्स अगो He organized a Buddhist council where scholars met and discussed important matters. Ashvaghosha, a poet who composed a biography of the Buddha, the Buddha Charitra, lived in his court. Ashvaghosha and other Buddhist scholars now began writing in Sanskrit. A new form of Buddhism, known as Mahayana Buddhism, now developed. This had two distinct features. Earlier, the Buddha's presence was shown in sculpture by using certain sites. For instance, his attainment of enlightenment was shown by sculptures of the peepal tree. Now, status of the Buddha were made. Statues. Many of these were made in Mathura, while others were made in Takshila. The second change was a belief in Buddhist tattvas. These were supposed to be persons who had attained enlightenment. Once they attained enlightenment, they could live in complete isolation and meditate in peace. However, instead of doing that, they remained in the world to teach and help other people. The worship of Buddhists. Satvas became very popular and spread throughout Central Asia, China, and later to Korea and Japan. Buddhism also spread to Western and Southern India, where dozens of caves were hollowed out of hills for monks to live in. Some of these caves were made on the orders of kings and queens, others by merchants and farmers. These were often located near passes through the western ghats roads connecting prosperous ports on the coast with cities in the deccan ran through these passes traders probably halted in these caves mon- monasteries during their travels buddhism also spread southeastwards to sri lanka myanmar thailand and other parts of southeast asia including indonesia the older form of buddhism known as theravada buddhism was more popular in these areas read page 100 once more can you think of how buddhism spread to these lands <clears throat> the quest of the pilgrims as traders journeyed to distant lands in caravans and ships pilgrims often traveled with them pilgrims are men and women who undertake journeys to holy places in order to offer worship the best known of these are the chinese buddhist pilgrims fa xian who came to the subcontinent about 1600 years ago zuan zhang who came around 1400 years ago and i came who came about 50 years after swan zhang they came to visit places associated with the life of the buddha chapter 6 as well as famous monasteries each of these pilgrims left an account of his journey they wrote of the dangers they encountered on their travels which often took years of the countries and the monasteries that they visited and the books they carried back with them swan so zhang who took the land route back to china through the northwest and central asia carried back with him st- statues of the buddha made of gold silver and sandalwood and over 600 manuscripts loaded on the backs of 20 horses over 50 manuscripts were lost when the boat on which he was crossing the indus capsized he spent the rest of his life translating the remaining manuscripts 
from Sanskrit into Chinese. The beginning of Bhakti. This was also the time when the worship of certain deities, which became a central feature of later Hinduism, gained in importance. These deities included Shiva, Vishnu, and goddess such as Durga. These deities were worshipped through Bhakti, an idea that became very popular at this time. Bhakti is generally understood as a person's devotion to his or her chosen deity. Anybody, whether rich or poor, belonging to the so-called high or low caste, man or woman, could follow the path of Bhakti. The idea of Bhakti is present in the Bhagavad Gita, a sacred book of the Hindus, which is included in the Mahabharata. See chapter 11. In this, Krishna the God asks Arjun, his devotee and friend, to abandon all dharmas and take refuge in him, as only he can set Arjuna free from every evil. This form of worship gradually spread to different parts of the country. Those who followed the system of bhakti emphasized devotion and individual worship of a god or goddess rather than the performance of elaborate sacrifices. According to this system of belief, if a devotee worships the chosen deity with a pure heart, the deity will appear in the form in which he or she may desire. So the deity could be thought of as human being, lion, tree or any other form. Once this idea gained acceptance, artists made beautiful images of the deities. Because the deities were special, these images of the deity were often placed within special homes, places that were described as temples. You will learn more about the temples in chapter 11. Bhakti inspired some of the best expressions in art, sculpture, poetry and architecture. Hindu. The word Hindu, like the term India, is derived from the river Indus. It was used by Arabs and Iranians to refer to people who lived to the east of the river and to their cultural practices including religious beliefs. Chapter 10 New Empires and Kingdoms Arvind plays a king. Arvind had been chosen to act as a king in the school play. He had expected to march solemnly in splendid robes to twirl his moustaches and wield the silver paper wrapped sword with custom. Imagine his surprise when he was told that he would also have to sit and play a veena and recite poetry. A musician king. Who was that? He wondered. Precious teens and what they tell us. Arvind was supposed to be acting as Samudra Gupta, a famous ruler of a dynasty known as the Guptas. We know about Samudra Gupta from a long inscription inscribed on the Ashokan pillar at Allahabad. It was composed as a kavya by Hari Shena, who was a poet and a minister, the court of Samudra Gupta. This inscription is of a special kind known as Prashasti. A Sanskrit word meaning in praise of, while prashastis were composed for some of the rulers you read about in chapter 9. Such as Gautamiputra, Sri Satakarni, they became far more important from the time of the Guptas. Samudra Gupta's Prashasti Let us see what Samudra Gupta's Prashasti tells us. The poet praised the king in glowing terms as a warrior, as a king who won victories in battle, who was learned and the best of poets. He is also described as equal to gods. The Prashasti was composed in very long sentences. Here is part of one such sentence. If you may look at map 7, page 105, you will notice an area shaded in green. You will also find a series of red dots along the east coast. And you will find areas marked in purple and blue as well. 
This map is based on the information provided in the Prashasti. Harishena describes four different kings of rulers and tells us about Samudra Gupta's policies towards them. The ruler of Aryavrata, the area shaded in green on the map. Here there were nine rulers who were uprooted and their kingdoms were made a part of Samudra Gupta's empire. The rulers of Dakshinapatha, here there were 12 rulers, some of whose capitals are marked with red dots on the map. They surrendered to Samudra Gupta after being defeated and he then allowed them to rule again. The inner circle of neighboring states including Assam, Coastal Bengal, Nepal and a number of Ghana Sanghas. Remember chapter 5 in the northwest marked in purple on the map. They brought tribute, followed his orders and attended his court. The rulers of the outlying areas marked in blue on the map, perhaps the descendants of the Kushanas and Shakas and the ruler of Sri Lanka who submitted to him and offered daughters in marriage. Find Prayaga, the old name for Allahabad, Ujjain and Patliputra, Patna on the map. These were important centers of the Gupta rulers. What was the difference between the way in which Samudra Gupta treated the ruler of Aryavrata and Dakshinapata? Can you suggest any reason for this difference? Genealogies Most Prashastis also mention the ancestors of the ruler. This one mentions Samudra Gupta's great grandfather, grandfather, father, and mother. His mother, Kumara Devi, belonged to the Lechavi Gana while his father Chandragupta was the first ruler of the Gupta dynasty. To adopt the grand title of Maharaja Tiraj, a title that Samudra Gupta also used, his great grandfather and grandfather are mentioned simply as Maharajas. It seems as if the family gradually rose to importance. Arrange these titles in order of importance, Raja, Maharaja, Diraja and Maharaja. Samudra Gupta in turn figures in the genealogies list of ancestors of that of later rulers of the dynasty, such as his son Chandragupta II. We know about him from inscriptions and coins. He led an expedition to Western India where he overcame the last of the Shakas. According to later belief, his court was full of learned people, about some of them whom you will read in chapter 11. Harshvardhana and the Harsha Charitta While we can learn about the Gupta ruler from their inscriptions and coins, we can find out about some kings from biographies. Harshvardhana, who ruled nearly 1400 years ago, was one such ruler. His court poet Banabhatta wrote his biography, the Harsha Charita, in Sanskrit. This gives us the genealogy of Harsha and ends with his becoming king. Xuanzang, about whom you read in chapter 9, also spent a lot of time at Harsha's court and left a detailed account of what he saw. Harsha was not the eldest son of his father but became the king of Thanesa. About after both his father and elder brother died, his brother-in-law was the ruler of Karnoch. See map 7 and he was killed by the ruler of Bengal. Harsha took over the kingdom of Karnoj and then led an army against the ruler of Bengal. Although he was successful in the east and conquered Magda and probably Bengal, also he was not as successful elsewhere. He tried to cross the Narmada to march into the Deccan, but was stopped by the ruler belonging to the Chalukya dynasty, Pulakshin II. Look at political map of India and list the present-day states which Harshavardhana passed through when he went to Bengal and up to the Narmada the Pallavas Chalukyas and Pulakshin's Prashasti. The Pallavas and Chalukyas were the most important ruling dynasties in South India during this period. The kingdom of the Pallavas spread from the region around their capital, Kanchipuram, to the Kaveri Delta, while that of the Chalukyas was centered 
around the Raichur Dob between the rivers Krishna and Tungabhadra. Ayol, the capital of the Chalukyas, was an important trading center. See map 7. It developed as a religious center with a number of temples. The Pallavas and the Chalukyas frequently raided one another's lands, especially attacking the capital cities, which were prosperous towns. The best known Chalukya ruler was Pulakshin II. We know about him from a prashasti composed by his court poet Ravi Kriti. This tells us about his ancestors who are traced back through four generations from father to son. Pulakshin evidently got the kingdom from his uncle. According to Ravi Kriti, he led expeditions along both the west and the east coast. Besides, he checked the advance of Harsha. There is an interesting play of words in the poem. Harsha means happiness. The poet says that after this defeat, Harsha was no longer Harsha. Pulakshin also attacked the Pallava king who took shelter behind the walls of Kanchipur. But the Chalukya victory was short-lived. Ultimately, both the Pallavas and the Chalukyas gave way to new rulers belonging to the Rashtrakuta and Chola dynasty about which you will study in class 7. Who were the other rulers who tried to control the coast and why? And see chapter 9. How were these kingdoms administered? As in the case of earlier kings, land revenue remained important for these rulers and the village remained the basic unit of administration. There were some new developments as well. Kings adopted a number of steps to win the support, support of men who were powerful, either economically or socially, or because of their political and military strength. For instance, some important administrative posts were now hereditary. This means that sons succeeded fathers to these posts. For example, the poet Harishena was a Maha Danda Nayaka or chief judicial officer like his father. Sometimes one person held many offices. For instance, besides being a Maha Danda Nayaka, Harishena was a Kumar Amatya, meaning an important minister and a Sandhi Vikra Ika meaning a minister of war and peace. Besides, important men probably had a say in local administration. These included the Nagara Shreshti, or chief banker or merchant of the city, the Sartavaha, or leader of the merchant caravans, the Prathama Kulika, or the chief craftsman, and the head of the Kayasas, or scribe. These policies were reasonably effective, but sooner or later, some of these powerful men grew strong enough to set up independent kingdoms. What do you think may have been the advantages and disadvantages of having hereditary officers? A new kind of army. Like earlier, rulers, some of these kings maintained a well-organized army with elephants, chariots, cavalry, and foot soldiers. Besides, there were military leaders who provided the king with troops whenever he needed them. They were not paid regular salaries. Instead, some of them received grants of land. They collected revenue from the land and used this to maintain soldiers and horses and provide equipment of warfare. These men were known as Samantas. Whenever the ruler was weak, Samantas tried to come to become independent. Assemblies in the southern kingdom. The inscriptions of the Pallavas mention a number of local assemblies. These included the Sabha, which was an assembly of Brahmin land owners. This assembly functioned through subcommittees which looked after irrigation, agriculture, operations, making roads, local temples, etc. The Ur was a village assembly found in areas where the landowners were not Brahmins and the Nagarama 
was an organization of merchants. It is likely that these assemblies were controlled by rich and powerful landowners and merchants. Many of these local assemblies continued to function for centuries. Ordinary people in the kingdoms. We can catch an occasional glimpse of the lives of ordinary people from plays and other accounts. Let us look at some of these. Kalidasa is known for his play depicting life in the king's court. An interesting feature about these plays is that the king and the most Brahmins are shown as speaking Sanskrit, while women and men other than the king and Brahmins use Prakrit. His most famous play Abhijanana Shakuntalam is the story of the love between a king named Dushyanta and a young woman named Shakuntala. We find an interesting description of the plight of a poor fisherman in this play. The Chinese pilgrim Fashian noticed the plight of those who were treated as untouchables by the high and mightly. They were expected to live on the outskirts of the city. He writes, if such a man enters a town or a marketplace, he strikes a piece of wood in order to keep himself separate. People hearing this sound know what it means and avoid touching him or brushing against him. And Banavata provides us with a vivid picture of the king's army on the move. Chapter 11 Buildings, Paintings and Books Marutasami and the Iron Pillar Marutasami was so excited, his brother had propelled his wheelchair all along the dusty stony path past the towering Qutub Minar and up the metal ramp. It had been tough, but now he was here in front of the famous Iron Pillar. It was an unforgettable experience. The Iron Pillar The Iron Pillar at Meroli, Delhi is a remarkable example of the skill of Indian craftspersons. It is made of iron, 7.2 meter high and weighs over 3 tons. It was made about 1500 years ago. We know the date because there is an inscription on the pillar mentioning a ruler named Chandra, who probably belonged to the Gupta dynasty. Chapter 10 what is amazing is the fact that the pillar has not got rusted in all these years. Building in bricks and stone, the skills of our craftspersons are also apparent in the buildings that have survived, such as stupas. The word stupa means a mound. While there are several kinds of stupas, round and tall, big and small, these have certain common features. Generally, there is a small box placed at the center or heart of the stupa. This may contain bodily remains such as teeth, bone or ashes of the Buddha or his followers or things they used, as well as precious stones and coins. This box, known as a relic casket, was covered with earth. Later, a layer of mud brick or baked brick was added on top and then the dome-like structure was sometimes covered with carved stone slabs. Often a path known as the Pratakshina Patha was laid around the stupa. This was surrounded with railings. Entrance to the path was through gateways. Devotees walked around the stupa in a clockwise direction as a mark of devotion. Both railings and gateways were often decorated with sculpture. Find Amravati on map 7 page 105 this was a place where a magnificent stupa once existed many of the stone carvings for decorating the stupa were made about 2000 years ago other buildings were hollowed out of rock to make artificial caves some of these were very elaborately decorated with sculptures and painted walls some of the earliest hindu temples were also built at this time Deities such as Vishnu, Shiva and Durga were worshipped in these shrines. The most important part of the temple was the room known as the Garbhakriha, where the image of the chief deity was placed. It was here that priests performed religious rituals and devotees offered worship to the deity. Often as the Bidar Gao, a tower known as the Shikara was built on top of the Garbhakriha, Griha to mark this out as sacred place. Building shikaras required 
careful planning, most temples also had a space known as the Mandapa. It was a hall where people could assemble. Find Mahabalipuram and Ayul on map 7, page 105. Some of the finest stone temples were built in these towns. Some of these are shown here. How were stupas and temples built? There were several stages in building a stupa or a temple. Usually kings or queens decided to build these as it was an expensive affair. First, good quality stone had to be found, quarried and transported to the place that was often carefully chosen for the new building. Here, these rough blocks of stone had to be shaped and carved into pillars and panels for walls floors and ceilings and then these had to be placed in precisely the right position. Kings and queens probably spent money from their treasury to pay the craft persons who worked to build these splendid structures. Besides, when devotees came to visit the temple or the supa, they often brought gifts which were used to decorate the buildings. For example, an association of ivory workers paid for one of the beautiful gateways at Sachi. Among the others who paid for decorations were merchants, farmers, garland makers, perfumers, smiths and hundreds of men and women who are known by only by their names, which were inscribed on pillars, railings and walls. So when you get a chance to visit any of these buildings, remember how several hundreds of people probably worked to construct and decorate them. Make a diagram like the one on page 88, chapter 8 to show the stages in the building of a temple or stupa. Painting. Find Ajanta on map 7, page 105. This is a place where several caves were hollowed out of the hills over centuries. Most of these were monasteries for Buddhist monks and some of them were decorated with paintings. Here are some examples. As the caves are dark inside, most of these paintings were done in the light of torches. The colors, which are vivid even after 1500 years, were made of plants and minerals. The artist who created these splendid works of art remain unknown. The World of Books Some of the best known epics were written during this period. Epics are grand, long compositions about heroic men and women and include stories about gods. A famous Tamil epic, the Silapatikaram, was composed by a poet named Elango. Around 1800 years ago, it is the story of a merchant named Kovalan who lived in Puhar and fell in love with the courtesan named Madhvi, neglecting his wife Kanangi. Later, he and Kanangi left Puhar and went to Madurai, where he was wrongly accused of theft by the court jeweler of the Pandya king. The king sentenced Kovalan to death. Kanagi, who still loved him, was full of grief and anger at this injustice and destroyed the entire city of Madurai. Another Tamil epic, the Mani Mekali, was composed by Satanar around 1400 years ago. This describes the story of the daughter of Kovalan and Madhavi. These beautiful compositions were lost to scholars for many centuries, till their manuscripts were rediscovered about a hundred years ago. Other writers such as Kalidasa, about whom you read in chapter 10, wrote in Sanskrit. Recording and Preserving Old Stories a number of Hindu religious stories that were in circulation earlier were written down around the same time. These include the Puranas. Purana literally means old. The Puranas contain stories about gods and goddesses such as Vishnu, Shiva, Durga and Parvati. They also contain details on how they were to be worshipped. Besides, there are accounts about the creation of the world and about kings. The Puranas were written in simple Sanskrit verse and were meant to be heard by everybody, including women and Shudras, who were not allowed to study the Vedas. They were probably recited in temples by priests and people came to listen them. 
two sanskrit epics mahabharata and ramayana had been popular for a very long time some of you may be familiar with these stories the mahabharata is about a war fought between the kauravas and the pandavas who were cousins this war this was a war to gain control of the throne of the kurus and their capital hastinapur the story itself was an old one but was written down in the form in which we know it today about 1500 years ago both the puranas and the mahabharata are supposed to have been compiled by vyasa the bhagavad gita about which you learnt in chapter 9 was also included in the mahabharata the ramayana is about rama the a prince of kosala who was sent into exile his wife sita was abducted by the king of lanka named ravana the rama had to fight a battle to get her back he won and returned to ayodhya the capital of kosala after his victory like the mahabharata this was an old story that was now written down valmiki is recognized as the author of the sanskrit ramayana there are several several versions many of which are performed by uh, of the mahabharata and the ramayana popular amongst people in different parts of the subcontinent find out about a version in your state stories told by ordinary people ordinary people also told stories composed poems and songs sang danced and performed plays some of these are preserved in collections of stories such as the jatakas and the panchatantra which were written down around this time stories from the jatakas were often shown on the railings of stupas and in paintings in places such as ajanta here is one such story writing books on science this was also the time when aryabhatta a mathematician and astronomer wrote a book in sanskrit known as aryabhatyam he stated that day and night were caused by the rotation of the earth on its axis even though it seems as if the sun is rising and setting every day he developed a scientific explanation for eclipse as well he also found a way of calculating the circumference of a circle which is nearly as accurate as the formula we use today varamirya brahmagupta and bhaskaracharya were some other mathematicians and astronomers who made several discoveries try and find out more about them